Thanks. Here we go. We are uh, in progress. We're recording too. Progress is nice, isn't it? That's what the Communist Party used to label everything. Progress. <laughs> in their populist methodology. But we are the Jewish Socialist Bund. And this is the uh, Vanguard Circle talking here. This is... Uh, this is where we decide things. This is like council, council of methodology, which is uh, <clears throat> which is the methodology of the Orient. You know, in Palestine, when you want to decide something, you have a council. It's not you know like one uh, manip manipulator, you know, talking with with their sycophant, you know, deciding that they're going to impose their opinion on everybody else. No, a council methodology is where. The you know the cadre, the leading members, the founders, the uh, organizers, the <clears throat> the uh, activists, you know, come together and decide, you know, uh, with a co collective knowledge of each of them, what is best for each of them together. You know, that's the only way to work. You know, this democratic centralism that's what killed the Soviet Union. You know, and it worked that way in the economy as well. Even Che Guevara noted that. He criticized the Soviet Union for having a capitalist methodology in its industrial hierarchy, even though it was owned by the state, but it was still organized on a capitalist, you know, methodology. What do you think of the uh, Yugoslav concept of workers' self-management? Yeah, they had some very good things going there, including a multinational society. Yeah, Yugoslavia had its own revolution. Yeah, too bad it was bombed. Oh yeah, bombed and also Libya got bombed. You know this is this is a developing fascist you know wave that they're trying to build up because they're being faced with a, an arising international revolution. You know, starting in the third world, speaking from a third worldist perspective, and uh, so they're willing to go fascist in order to stop it from happening. I mean, the United States is still willing to go fascist, and and they've just to lift the ban on the on the uh, arms that they didn't want to send to Israel. Now they're sending them, you know, the bigger bombs. Right. But they're sending only half of the quantity that they sent before, you know. So they want it to look as bad as it did before. So if it looks better, then as far as they're concerned, you know, that nullifies, you know, what happened before. <laughs> you know, I know the way the State Department works. You know, like every other sort of assault on Gaza, you know, usually lasted two weeks, the United States full support, and then the United States said, oh, you know, like, you're going too far, you know, you've got to stop. And then they stop. Okay. This is like three times now that they've been assaulting Gaza, only this time they didn't tell them to stop. And, then and since October the 7th, you know, like, how much, uh, how many billions have been spent there? Like, 67 billion or something I saw the other day. Wow. Yeah, and Trump is critical of Biden for not doing even more. <laughs> so if he gets elected in November, he will do I more. I can't believe it. Yes. Yeah. Or try to. Did you see uh did you see the uh presidential debate yesterday, Andrew? I actually slept through it to be honest. Good for you I, because I it was like much. junk. It was just junk. You know, Trump, you know, like saying whatever, you know, lies. Biden saying their lies, and then saying how much better he is, you know, than the than a sack full of lies, which is not much better. And uh, that was a, it. I did see a live stream earlier where someone was commenting on it, and uh, Biden actually said that Hamas doesn't want the war to end. Huh. Hmm. Well, so, that's backwards. That's yeah. What they're proposing is a, a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire, but not an end to the occupation. You know, that uh, ceasefire proposal that they've made only uh, says that Israel withdraws to non-populated areas, non-populated areas inside Gaza. Yeah. You know, so they have, you know, total military control. Whenever they want to jump in to any populated areas, they can do it. Okay, so and no wonder, you know, Hamas doesn't want to uh, accept that aspect of it. So Hamas accepted the general ceasefire proposal but stipulated that at the end, you know, the Zionist forces had to withdraw from Gaza, and they don't agree to that, neither the Zionist state nor uh, the United States. So the war is still on. It's continuing. 
And we've got this historic responsibility to answer it. Huh. Yeah, and, and no matter who gets elected in November, it, nothing will change. It'll be, it'll be the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Same. Except, you know, like, except for the talk from Biden about uh, supporting a Palestine state. Hmm. So the United States is not going to support that in the Security Council. It's going to be vetoed. So that will cause a crisis in the United Nations with Trump. And then the United Nations are going to have to overthrow the Security Council. The General Assembly is going to have to overrule the Security Council by an absolute two-thirds majority, and they can do it. And there's even a clause in the Charter that allows them to do it, but they've never implemented it. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's this, not known. It's not security, you know mentioned ever. <laughs> the Security Council is the bedrock of, of, of the UN. Yeah, well... That's why the United States had that clause put into the charter because, you know, they were afraid of the uh, USSR veto. So mm -hmm. they wanted something that they could use to overrule a veto from the USSR. But now it can be used to overrule a veto from the US. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. My, my. But uh, the big problem for us is that the anti-Semites are using a variant of anti-Zionism to criticize Israel and the war in Gaza, the genocide in Gaza, to attack all Jewish people. There's a lot of anti-Semitism coming out now. Like uh, I'm, I moderate, you know, a number of lists, including a, a big list of 170,000 in France, mm -hmm. and the number of submissions, you know, that I have to reject, is growing. It's incredible. And then there's also these comments, you know, always these comments, you know, equating the Zionists with uh, the devil or with uh, a and uh, making, you know, Zionism into a, a biological entity, which means that they are actually referring to Jewish people if they're referring to a biological, you know, entity like that. And uh, that follows the Christian phrase in the New Testament about the children of the devil. Which in which they mean the Jewish people. Or the seed of the serpent as interpreted by many Christians. Uh, so, you know, they're using this, you know, especially the tendency that supports Trump, but that is anti-Zionist, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And they use their anti-Zionism not to support the Palestinians. <laughs> no, they just use their anti-Zionism to attack the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And then they say things like, and they even said this, you know, there was a similar guy, you know, like this libertarian line <clears throat> that intervened in a, a video that was done with uh, Tony Greenstein in England, in which this guy comes onto the video and he says, you know, like, uh, how can you not uh, consider that it's the Jewish people who are at fault here for having created Zionism? And then that's, you know, just an additional reason to explain why the Jewish people always get expelled from various countries is because, you know, they're doing something bad. You know, that explains, you know, why the Jewish people are oppressed. And, you know, a lot of people believe that. Even Marxists, especially Marx, basically is, that's what he was saying. Now, he, Tony he, Greenstein is a Marxist and he, and he couldn't. Even though he was ancestrally Jewish, which is, which is absurd. Yeah, but he was raised Lutheran. So he, he was raised. He was raised Lutheran, yeah. But, but, but he knew what his ancestry was. Yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, he followed. You know the this uh, populist notion. You know that Jewish people are oppressed because they're bad, and that well, starts off. You know, with the Christian sort of reason for denouncing Jewish people, because yeah. it's supposedly the Jewish people who turned against. You know, Yehoshua ben Ye Ye uh, Yusuf. Yeah he, yeah, he called Jews Jew dogs. Yeah. He, that's what he called Jews, Jew dogs. So Who I, did? So, Marx. Really? Oh, yeah. Whoa. Jew dogs. I never knew that. Yeah. 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 Well, that was not in, his, not, not in his writings conversationally. Uh huh. He never wow. actually. Well, so this Tony Greenstein, he's, he's you know, pure Marxist, so he couldn't answer. You know this uh, libertarian, you know Nazi, 
and you know then and, and they and i tried to answer you know in the comments you know but i wasn't given the opportunity to intervene in that webinar because because tony greenstein doesn't want to allow me to talk but mm -hmm. anyway i would have replied you know that uh the Zionists are only, you know, the leadership of the Jewish people because the Jewish Bund got wiped out. Because prior to the Holocaust, it was the Jewish Bund that was the leadership of the Jewish people that represented the Jewish people. And the Zionists, you know, had no right to speak in the name and act in the name of the Jewish people. In fact, Britain, you know, when they sent, you know, a letter, you know, for the Balfour Declaration to Rothschild, he wasn't even, you know, a, a political representative in any Jewish body, you know, of the Jewish people. They just sent the letter to him, you know, because they, they knew his name, you know, like, and he was a lord, you know, so... That was, you know, good enough for the British. But, you know, no way do the Zionists represent the Jewish people. It's so arbitrary. It's unsupportable. It's intolerable. You know, and we, together with the, you know, the new generations, you know, the Jewish protest movement, Jewish Voice for Peace, you know, like, okay. It's a big collection of people, you know, a number of people. And they think that the more Jewish people, you know, are members, you know, the better if not now, and not in our name. Now, not in our name is the closest to the Bund, I would say, you know, because they talk about our. What do they mean by our? They're talking about the Jewish people. But the others are not talking about the Jewish people. They're not, they're just talking about Jewish individuals. And they have a collection of Jewish individuals and they say, oh, you know, we're credi credible because we have a lot of Jewish people saying the same thing. Yeah. That's not good enough, you know, because they're speaking to the non-Jewish people in that way. But what are they saying to the Jewish people? Nothing. They don't go into the American Jewish Congress and contest the Zionist leadership. They don't, you know, run an opposition in the elections. As far as I know, they don't do anything. That's the problem. We have to remove the Zionist parties, you know, from the control of the Jewish community. And then that's part of the whole boycott, you know, BDS campaign as well, because they do a... a, a you know, a collection run of the Jewish community every year, of the Jewish, uh, United Jewish Appeal, I think they call it. Yeah, the United Jewish Appeal. My so parents, they, that old. Yeah. yeah, so they intimidate Jewish people into contributing to that, like a tax, mm -hmm. even though, you know, they don't get to vote for any leadership. And uh, then 35% of those donations are sent, you know, to the Israel government, even though they don't have an election, a vote in that, that election either. It's like a whole setup like a dictatorship, a Zionist dictatorship. And we can contest this. We can take the sun and we can win together with the Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, <laughs> not in our name. You know. But the other organizations don't even realize how much power they have and how much power they could have if they intervene in the Jewish community. But we can teach them. We just have to contact them. We do. You know, the last uh, piece that I wrote, an appeal, an appeal uh, from uh, Palestinian and Jewish people to the Jewish people. That appeal was uh, picked up by somebody from the Jewish Voice for Peace that published it in some magazine. I don't know where. But it's not gone far enough. So that's uh, my introduction. <laughs> Let's each take a turn. You know, what are your thoughts for the week? Uh, Good introduction. Okay, Mark. <laughs> Antifa, Antifa, Mark. Um, yeah, Antifa, Mark. It's a base, baseball cap. That I, I just got this last last week. Um, the um, I mean, I guess I I am not optimistic. Um, I, 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 I mean, I was optimistic 30 years ago. Since that time, I basically, basically, I, I become a pessimist and a, and, and a cynic, which I, some people see as contradictory, but not, not in my head. To me, I can be a pessimist and a cynic at the same time. Cynic in the sense that I, I, I don't trust people. I don't trust most people. And a pessimist meaning I don't think that the, the consequences of what we're doing right now will be successful. So I, you know, I, I, I think that I think that we, we, we can work for, um, for for social justice for, for Palestinians, for Jews, 
and for others. But the question is, will most people around the world work with us? I hope so, but I don't, I don't see it. I just don't see it. We are too divided. I, I look at my own country, the United States, and I see the tremendous divisions which exist between Americans, even on basic mm -hmm. things. And the way Americans um, openly hate each other, attack mm -hmm. each other. We are a really, really split country here. Mm -hmm. And I believe Canada is, but not quite to the same degree that the United States is. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe going in that direction, though. But um, but the U.S. is very, is very, very split. And uh, but but there is no I mean. I wish that there were. One of those splits did support. Something like the Bund, but I, I don't see it. And so I think it's something that we have to work for and promote. Because, at, you know, as of right now, I mean, we when I look at polls as a sociologist, I look at polls on public opinion on uh, on the question of. Uh, of Israel and Palestine, and uh, most most Americans basically are are opposed to the current war right now, um, by by or terrorist campaign by Israel against uh, Gaza. But most Americans um, have have no desire to see a Palestinian state either, or any kind of Palestinian sovereignty. When asked that question, do you believe there should be Palestinian sovereignty? Most Americans say no. Hmm. most Americans. So that's why I'm a cynic and that's why I'm a pessimist. I, I just don't see much hope. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I see a, a, a crumbling, what, what um, Emmanuel Wallerstein, of course, called the capitalist world system in his world systems analysis. He predicted about 10 years ago that the capitalist world system would crumble within 30 years. So I guess now 20 years, if he still has that same view. I hope he's That's right. Possible. Hmm. I hope he's right. Maybe even sooner. Hmm. But but I just don't see any any real um, movement toward um, toward toward any desire for Palestinian sovereignty or Palestinian rights. There are some people who believe in it, but it's not enough people to. to I mean, you still have Biden claiming over and over again, I'm a Zionist. Hmm. And people protest in his own party against him, has no effect on him. Yeah. He still keeps on saying it. Hmm. So I, you know, I just, I mean, and, and then his, his, his opponent, Trump says, oh, Biden is not even Zionist enough. He's not supporting Netanyahu enough. If I get elected, I will support Israel even more. There will be no conditions attached mm -hmm. to U.S. support. If I get elected. Yes. Well, there have been no conditions. You know, Biden has been well, giving yeah. everything. Anyway, yeah, but, you know. But, he, but he's making believe that there are conditions. He's making yeah. believe. And he's we're not obliged to choose between, you know, Biden and Trump, you know. No. We're rejecting both of them. Yeah. Dr. Jill Stein, she's magnificent. She even got arrested at a Palestine Solidarity demo. And charged with obstruction of police, you know, this, you know, uh, is you know, slim, tiny, you know, gray-haired woman is being charged with obstruction of police. You know, like, must be, you know, like pretty small police, you know, to be obstructed by her. She is a good person, but what chance does she have of being elected? She, she, oh no, she, that's not the point. We don't want to get get her elected. No, she just no, she has. She can just uh, steal the majority from both of them. Then they cannot claim to represent all the American people. Because, you know, in liberal democracy, liberal theory, if you have 50 plus one, you can claim to be, you know, representing the unan you know, nan unanimous voice of the entire people. Yeah. Because that's the only way in which they figured you could find a representative, you know, voice to uh, claim that it is unanimous is by claiming a, a majority because there was no other you know way to do so that's a liberal theory you know yeah no talk about consensus no talk about you know absolute two-thirds majority <clears throat> no talk about referendums you know nothing that's you know liberal 
you know, democratic theory is practically vacant, an empty, you know, cupboard, you know, only one thing in there, 50 plus one, you know, useless. And it's not even, you know, used in the United States, you know, because you have the elect electoral college, you know, in order to give more weight, you know, to the German American states, basically, yeah. is why that was in order to get their support, you know, against the South. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was, it was also a way of basically enticing uh, the former Confederate states to, uh, to yeah. uh, support it. I mean, yeah. I mean, because the Confederate states were not, were not going to support yeah. the Constitution if, if, if they did not have uh, a chance of being heard. And now, yeah. like, a state like Montana has as many electors as California, as many senators as California. Not as many representatives, but as many senators and electors. Hmm. That's not democracy. Uh, no, no. So uh, what has the week been like for you, Andrew? What have you noticed? Well, I, one major thing that happened was uh, Julian Assange is finally free. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, he is. But he had to make two concessions. He had, he had oh. to plead guilty to felonies um, in the process, but one felony, one. The only thing he really did illegal was miss the bail hearing. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but he's uh. back in Australia, so. But he had to concede to uh, plead guilty to one charge of, uh, I forget what it was, and uh, and also he agreed to destroy part of the archive. That hadn't been uh, made public yet, which was more serious, uh, as if he had the only copy, as if he hadn't shared it yet, if they didn't have a mirror site or something. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if they did have any backup, but uh, that was agreed to that they would destroy a large part of the archives that they had from the. Uh, what do they call them? The Pentagon Papers. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So okay, but nonetheless, he's he's free, and it feels like a victory. And but they can use to... that uh, that uh, guilty plea as a as a precedent to attack other journalists. That's one problem with it. But when it comes to uh. Gaza and Palestine at the moment like in the near future when it comes to the near future I'm not too optimistic but the way things go you mic went out oh, you, yeah you, you, you shut down your mic there okay there you are if Vietnamese peasants can defeat the strongest military on earth I believe that uh, that Freedom fighters as well as well as um, other people in Gaza will be able to defeat Israel eventually. Yeah. Yeah. With a lot of help. <sighs> With a lot of help. Absolutely. But uh, the problem we're presented with by Zionism that they have this, you know, like solid core base of support amongst the indoctrinated Israelis. They can keep on going for a long time you know it's not going to be so easy you know because those people don't have any other country to go to despite you know whatever you know like a lot of you know stereotypical thinking people f believe that you know the israelis can just leave like the french left algeria but no you know like from what i read you know only 17 percent of the population jewish israeli population have dual citizenship and can go and uh, reside somewhere else I mean, they can leave right now, you know, for a vacation until the end of the war. <laughs> but uh, you go live somewhere else, there's not that many opportunities for Jewish people to go live anywhere else. Yeah. You know, like this is, we're talking about 7.2 million Jewish Israelis. Is the United States of America going to take in 7.2 million Jewish Israelis? Are they going to set up a territory in upper state New York? For 7.2 million Jewish Israelis? I no. doubt it. I doubt it. Yeah. yeah. So there has to be a federation. You know, this is the no state solution, which is a concept that I, 
I discovered, you know, Mark discovered for me, that was actually mentioned by an anarchist one time in 2009. So that's the first, you know, reference I've seen to the term once, no state solution. And, uh, but the way he described it, you know, like was pretty vacant. It was just a, a matter of saying states are bad, you know, and that was, that was it. Had no yeah, explanation that, of why it wouldn't work and he didn't yeah. have any program, transitional program on how to achieve it. So I think I elaborated, you know, a pretty, you know, uh, well-established concept of a no-state solution, the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations, by recognizing the Hebrew Nation in the first place, which some people find difficulty in doing, and uh, not calling it Israel, which the Zionists um, are addicted to. So, uh, but the uh, other references, uh, the other sort of, uh, like there's a new book that's come out uh, published by Yale University Press, Daniel Boyarin, who's published a book there with a fancy title, you know, from Yale University Press of a you know, no state solution, a Jewish manifesto. Incredible, you know, that Yale University Press would allow such a title because it's you know, pretty hard, that. you know. I've ordered a copy, you know, I've read, you know, the copy that's available, you know, limited pages on the uh, website. It's pretty good. And, they, and he does mention in his introduction right away that he uh, goes all the way, you know, from the Talmud to the uh, Yiddish Socialist Bund in order to get his uh, thoughts together on why he's supporting a new state solution. So we, we get mentioned there, you know. And he's also Daniel Boyarin from Yale is a member of one of the lists, you know, that we are affiliated with called the uh, Jews Who Speak Out list. And uh, boy, you know, like I'm, I'm really impressed. But that came out in 2023, uh, a number of years. So I, I think that um, my work that was published in English in 2018 may have inspired these others, you know. Then there's three others, you know, who referred to a no state solution as well in the last uh, two years this concept is you know is uh, exploding i think that it uh, can gain the attention of uh, of a lot of people because it is so logical because you know like you know when they call for a one state solution a Pal free palestine from the river to the sea it's just a dream you know there's no program there's no constitutional proposition there's no concept of what, you know, the Jewish Israelis are going to do or be or or think or, you know, or accept. You know, it's so, you know, you know fluff. It's all fluff. And then two-state solution, okay, you know, like, has its legal basis, you know, in international law and all that sort of thing. But to think that it's just a matter of two-state solution as a solution, no, it's just a something that could begin a solution. But it is not a solution in and of itself. They call it a solution because they wanted to stop and end just there, you know, with the Palestinian Authority taking over control over the Gaza Strip. And then everything is going to be hunky-dory. No way. This might seem like an ignorant question when it comes to my viewing of anarchism, but without a state, wouldn't they be susceptible to invasion? Yeah, they don't talk about that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they don't talk about that. You know, they talk about self-defense, you know, on a local level, but they don't talk about, you know, self-defense on a on a national level because they don't believe the nation exists. You know, that's the trouble with the the no state solution guy in 2008. You know, he didn't believe that there were nations and that's why there should be no states. You know, so you know, anarchism is very limited, very sort of, you know, uh, puerile in effect, I would say, mm -hmm. except for Proudhon who talked about a constitutional formula when he used the formulation of federation of federations. That works. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, some people have attacked him as basically trying to bring about a state in a kind of underhanded way by using the term, the term federation of federations. <laughs> How was that? Well, some people do that, you know, when they talk, but they talk about a confederation, like Br Brussels. Yeah. yeah. You know, Belgium is... is uh, is a confederation of two territories, sure. but that's not a federation. You know, federation is where you have uh, the uh, coexistence and the cohabitation of 
uh, uh, more than one nation. Mm -hmm. Sort they of live like together the in the same cities. Mm -hmm. What was that, Andrew? Sort of like the USSR or the Russian Federation. That's more like a confederation because I they see. have different, you know, ethnicities and different autonomous republics. They I call see. it a federation, but it's more like a confederation. Mm -hmm. But in Israel, Palestine, you know, like you already have three cities that are 50-50 mixed. There's Jerusalem, 50-50. You have uh, Haifa and Yaffa. I mean, they're sort of together, you know, but they're separate at the same time. And then you have Akka, Akra, you know, and they each have two names, mm -hmm. one in Hebrew and one in Arabic. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's already there, you know, like, and, 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 and generally speaking, you know, they're so sort of, you know, like together, so close to, you know, that you don't have any choice but to uh, give them their proper identity, you know, by way of providing them with the, the Buddhist, Buddhist concept of national cultural autonomy, which means that, you know, the people of a given nation have their autonomy, they have their own government, they have their own institutions, their own language, their own schools, their own religion, their own police force, you know, but uh, they don't have a separate territory, there's no frontier, they don't, they're not separate, it's not apartheid like, you know, there's no walls, you know, they live together, but they just vote for a different government. And they just get different, you know, like uh, a set of, you know, uh, social security measures, you know, from their own, from their own national sort of administration. That's all. Mm -hmm. And their children go to their own schools, and then they can also, you know, decide to have joint mixed schools too. You know, for for those uh, children who want to go to a mixed school. You know, there's no limitations on it, but each nation has to have its national cultural autonomy. This was the the Jewish Bund program. And that's what they were asking for in Poland and in every other country that Jewish people were living in. Yeah. And then there was the territorialists who wanted a Jewish territory in which the Jewish people would be a majority on a given piece of land. And this could have been possible in Russia, you know, in the Pale of Settlement, you know, because that's the uh, territorial ghetto that was set up by the Tsar. And Jewish people couldn't move outside of that territory, which was pretty big. It was like the size of Belarusia in that My area. My lived in one of those ghettos within Belarusia. Yeah, and it could have been a Jewish territory, part of a, a Russian confederation, you know, in the Soviet Union. But instead, they sent 26,000 Jewish people to settle in Birobijan on the border with China. Why? You know, like that's so short-sighted. And then also, you know, like their pact with Hitler that allowed the Nazis to occupy Poland and take over, you know, like uh, a few million Jewish people into concentration camps. That was allowed by the Stalin-Hitler pact. Plus, sending back the German communists who came to the USSR for refuge as refugees to escape the Nazis, they were sent back to the Nazis. I can't well, believe it. Well, what the U.S. did was... Uh... Uh, really, really awful. I think it was 1937 or 1938 when a uh, a ship was approaching the United States filled oh, yeah. with uh, entire Jewish families, and um, and and uh, the, the the U.S. Congress uh, voted against allowing them in. One member of Congress, I forget House or Senate. I'm not going to use the word. I would. I've never said this word, and never will. Like I've ne I've never said the N word. Uh, but he said, look, today, these children look like pretty little kids, but in 30 years, they will be, they will be disgusting looking K's. Wow. I'm pretty sure Anne Frank and her family were on one of those boats. Yeah, who were refused the visas. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And she died one week before the end of the war of typhus. Wow. Yeah, that was the SS San Luis. And it came first to Cuba. And they wouldn't have let the offload the refugees in Cuba, which was under what administration? Spanish or American at the time? American. Knows. American, yeah. American. And then they came to a uh, United States port and they weren't allowed to to unload there. Then they came to Halifax in Canada. They weren't allowed to unload there. 
they started off in Hamburg, Germany. So they went back to Europe, unloaded everybody in France, and then France got occupied. And then two thirds of those refugees died in concentration death camps. Yeah. So the United States didn't allow Jewish refugees in before the Holocaust, during the Holocaust, and even after the Holocaust. Yep. Because it's like the only reason that my my parents got into Canada is because my father had a sister here who was a citizen already from before the war, and she's sponsored uh, our family. And if a Jewish family didn't have a sponsor, then they were rejected. Because after it, my Jewish hands, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, if yeah, if if you didn't have a relative, then you were rejected. You know, just because you were Jewish, and the American politicians consciously didn't want to, uh, you know, lift the quota on Jewish uh, refugees or even fulfill the entire quota. Uh, of Jewish refugees into the United States who weren't sponsored by a by a, a family member. You know, like, and then, you know, like some Marxists <clears throat> like to say that there's no anti-Semitism in the United States, that the United States, you know, has allowed for, the, you know, has successfully accomplished the assimilation of the Jewish people. <laughs> you know, like, I can't believe the naivety of some people who are supposed to be, you know, sophisticated Marxists. Well, it's it's not as bad as it was. I know my father, um, you know who you know when he was first in in um, actually my father was in in the National Guard long before World War II started. But then his battalion was transferred into the army when after the, the mm -hmm. bombing of Pearl Harbor, and he said that when he one time he was having a uh, a conversation with a lieutenant, and and I'm not sure if he was a private or a corporal yet but uh, as far as he got was corporal um but he said this lieutenant walked up to him and said uh and apparently seriously and said um can i please see your horns what yeah and and my father said back to him how would how about if you take off your gun and walk out onto that lawn back there and invite all of your men to come out and surround you. Would that be okay? Now, he would have gotten into serious trouble, but there was, I think, a captain or a colonel there, and he said, keep quiet. He's smarter than you are, referring to my father. <laughs> uh, but so he, he got away with it. Uh, he got away with it. But <laughs> yeah, Christianity, Christians still believe, you know, that uh, Jewish people are the children of the devil. <laughs> In Quebec here, it used to be, in the countryside especially, you know, a lot of people used to you know, still believe that, you know, because the Catholic literal Church said horns. so. Literal horns. Yeah. My grandpa, who is an Ashkenazi Jew, who I've mentioned before, has this colonized mindset that ch uh, Jewish people are uh, inferior to Christians. Ooh. Why? Why? He's done what? Because Christians have crew cuts or what? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that's the case, you know, like in the 50s, you know, when I was a kid, the Christians had these crew cuts, you know, like military. Yeah. And they wouldn't talk to us, you know, they wouldn't talk to any Jewish people. And if we tried to talk to them, they would beat us up. <laughs> you know, like I got kicked in the balls. I that's how I discovered that I had balls. <laughs> yeah, my father got beat up as well, but I mean he grew up in a Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn, but uh, whenever he would uh, wander out, uh, I'm not sure how they knew he was Jewish. I mean, he was from a secular Jewish family, like like uh, my family was, was a secular Jewish family. Uh, mm -hmm. They were not practicing Jews, my, mm -hmm. you know, but somehow they knew, I guess maybe because of the direction he was walking from. I don't know, but he got beaten up many times. Yeah, you know, like changing your name, you know, doesn't doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, my, you know, my, my parents changed. going incognito, you know. Yeah, they changed the name from Feigenbaum to Foster. Yeah. But, you know, I read an, uh, an essay about SDS and about the SDS position on Palestine mm -hmm. and about the Jewish members of the SDS position on Palestine and uh, and how they got treated by the Jewish community. 
and all of these names, you know, are like English names of Jewish people, and they all turn out like Mark Rudd, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like yep, he's probably, Jewish. <laughs> Ruddenberg, Ruddenberg. Originally. Yeah, yeah. You know, like in the SDS, you know, there was there were so many, you know, of the SDS leaders who were Jewish, you know, had changed their names. Yeah, yeah. Incredible American phenomena, you know, like I can't believe it. Even here in Montreal, you know, in old Montreal, you know, like uh, there's one Bundist here, you know, whose family was changed, changed their name as well. Yeah, it's not just American, you know, like Jews had to change their name in order to be accepted as human, yeah. as in order to be accepted as a citizen. Yep. Yeah. And in France, if you want to uh, become a citizen there, you know, they ask you to change your first name to a Christian name. <laughs> really? Yeah. <sighs> I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah, it, this is I, called liberal democracy. This is the Christian right, nation right state. Now, right now, that's they a deny term. that there's Christian, but then they put on the dollar bill. You know, in God we trust. Which God are they talking about? You know, they don't even recognize that Allah is God. They think that Allah is a different God. <laughs> you know, like. Well, Allah has the same etymology as Elohim. Um, yes. Al both both yeah. are from, from the same root, which indicates the Almighty. Elohim is basically the plural of, of Eloha, which is the Almighty. So technically, I guess you would say gods, but it's uh, the Almighty, still the Almighty. Yeah. Same and, word. And, you know, the other name uh, of God that describes God, you know, Adonai, Lord, is yeah. very similar to uh, an African origin syntax. Because I heard, you know, from Se Senegalese musician friends listening to music, that there was this uh, constant reference, you know, repetition of the word Aduna. And I say, what is that Aduna Aduna all the time? And they say, well, that's you know, Sen Senegalese, you know, Wolof language for life. Hmm. I said, Oh, well, it's very similar to the you know Hebrew word for, for the deity, you know, like Aduna, you know. But they weren't suitably impressed. <laughs> they're just sort of, you know, oh yeah, okay, fine. You know, yeah. like, you know, they're so <laughs> used to their own language, you know, like they know that they're the origins of civilization. You know, you yeah. don't have to tell them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love the flag in the back there. Russian. Uh... It's Albanian. Albanian. Oh, Albanian. Ah. Why Albanian? Oh, uh, I just think Hoja was interesting. Oh, okay. Oh, uh huh. Attractiveness of it, yeah. It, it is. I don't know much about that. It's kind of spooky looking in a way. Yeah, it's oh. got the double eagle and a red star. Yeah, yeah. I love it. It looks very yeah. punk to me. Yeah, very <laughs> punk, yes. Very punk. Yeah. Gothic. Yeah. Uh, oh, um, now, so we know what, uh, what a big job that we have to take on, to take on the whole Zionist establishment. We're what's left of the, uh, of the Jewish Bund, you know, the Jewish labor Bund people, you know, they they just continue on, you know, with their social clubs, you know, as a chapter in the, uh, Workman circle, worker circle, you know, chapters in each city that they exist in, in New York, Montreal, Toronto. And they don't do anything. And then they let themselves get intimidated by the Zionists. When I went there one time to speak to the Jewish, uh, to the uh, worker circle, one Zionist came in there and he wouldn't let me talk. He kept on shouting at me and nobody did anything. You know, and I used to take my son there, you know, for, for lessons. And uh, and then he would shout at me there too, so I just pulled my son out of that crazy place. And didn't ever go back. Yeah, I should try to go and speak with them, but what was that, Andrew? I was actually thinking about signing up to the worker circle. Yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, we should intervene in there. The only problem here, in Montreal, is that they that uh, place where they have the meetings is like two hours away from me here. But uh, probably different in the U.S. or different chapters may have their own views on things. So yeah, they, never know. at least they'd be willing to listen, you know, because they would most likely they have you know different chapters. You know, one chapter would be a Bundes chapter, uh, another chapter would be like a social democratic chapter that would be affiliated with the Democratic Socialists of America. Mm -hmm. Another chapter would be a woman's chapter. Another chapter would be a children's uh, chapter. 
or summer camps or something like that. That's how they're organized. Even, even. And then they have Hanukkah parties and that's about it, you know? Hmm. Yeah. We wouldn't have anything like that here, sadly. In, in the oh, Rio, no. The Rio Grande Valley? No. Fortunately, I saw they a guy, mean. a musician who called himself uh, uh, Texas Jew something. <laughs> this was his <laughs> this was his <laughs> the text yeah, and he yeah he made a big thing about this you know like uh, and he he was sort of you know like famous and such <laughs> uh, anyway okay so what's coming up you there's know a new member of the bund his name is joseph i should report to you nice uh, and uh, he's somewhere in the United States. I forget where. And uh, but he he's not very active, you know. But he'll he'll get engaged. And uh, and uh, then um, there's another project uh, underway now. Um, the book uh, uh, of the Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations is going to be uh, published again in Algeria in Arabic translation with a new introduction by a, you know an academic from Algeria and uh, this is going to make up for the fiasco of the book being published in Arabic in Jordan where at first the publisher tried to change the cover because they wanted to make it look more like a Palestinian flag as if as if a federation is you know a state mm -hmm. just a Palestine state and uh, and after that, you know, they uh, even though the uh, you know I paid for the postage costs, you know, to send packages of the book, you know, to, to to North America, the money was never sent to Jordan, and the packages were never sent to North America. So the book is just sitting there. So that's a pretty well disaster. But it did get into Palestine. It was smuggled into Palestine, and it's in Nablus, and it's circulating. So, but with the Algerian uh, edition, <clears throat> then it can uh, be mailed out more easily, get into Palestine, even by mail, and also make a big circulation in Algeria, and then I can go to Algeria to meet people there and do a session in uh, English, French, and in Arabic. To I've do, actually uh, seen evidence. I can't hear you, Andrew. I've seen evidence that the IDF is planting Arabic copies of Mein Kampf in Palestinian homes. Whoa. Why? Yeah, well, to use that as an excuse, you know, to uh, denounce them oh, as I being see. Nazis. Oh, I, see. I see, I see, I see. You know, this is the justification for genocide. I was thinking, what's, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. Makes... Well, also, you know, the Nazis had, you know, free reign uh, for six years, and they broadcast in Arabic, you know, on radio, to the Arab countries. So they got six years of propaganda into there. And they were claiming, you know, that they were supporting the Arabs against Jewish imperialism, which is how they described Zionism. Nowadays, some of even the Jewish Israeli uh, opposition, they use the same kind of terminology and they talk about Jewish supremacism. It's not Jewish supremacism, it's Zionist supremacism. They don't represent the Jewish people. And yet they believe that the, they believe the Zionists that they do, you know, they're, they are anti-Zionists who were Zionists and who are still Zionists in some ways. You know, they still haven't decolonized, you know, their, their Jewish minds, you know, from the Zionist indoctrination. Yep. So, you know, like, you know, the, the Arab populations were also indoctrinated, you know, by the Nazis. And so they, a, a lot of them, you know, like, still, you know, think that, you know, Hitler was an anti-Zionist. When in fact, you know, the Nazis collaborated with the Zionists. That's right. They don't know about that. That's right. But, you know, Hitler made some speeches in which he was, you know, saying that he was anti-Zionist. And they go for it. And they use those videos still. It was what is that with the Hitler and the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem or no. whatever? No. Husseini, yeah, who was appointed by the British in the first place. Uh, yeah, it was... Yeah. It, but but I mean Hitler was Hitler was willing to do anything which would get Jews out of uh, Germany and surrounding countries. So if he could make make all Jews into uh, 
in a greater uh, way. Uh, uh, no, actually, he didn't allow Jews to leave Germany. When they when they tightened to the control, when they got full control, they wouldn't allow Jewish people to leave. They wanted to kill off the Jewish people. They didn't want them to survive. But, I mean, but so they made an exception for the Zionists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So at the same time, they're saying that they stand for, you know, like uh, that they are supporting the Arabs and the Palestinians against Jewish imperialism. And that's the same thing that the Japanese said to the Chinese when they occupied Manchuria. <laughs> you know, it's so uh, both ironic uh, and uh, hypocritical. <clears throat> so they occupied Manchuria, saying that the reason they were doing so was to support, you know, the liberation of the Chinese, you know, peoples from Western imperialism. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they were occupied by Western imperialism. So the Japanese came in saying that they were going to liberate them from Western imperialism. But the Chinese Communist Party didn't go for that. But yeah. the Kuomintang did. Kuomintang collaborated with the Japanese in occupation. And I so the Communist that. Party eventually had to break that uh, coalition that they had with the Kuomintang. And Mao Zedong realized that being massacred in 1936 by the Kuomintang was no good thing and went and uh, left the uh, city to join the peasants and formed a different kind of uh, revolution entirely that was nonetheless socialist, I believe. What do you think, Andrew? The way I look at it is uh, the Chinese, I mean, the Communist Party of China well, under Mao Zedong was a better party than the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Mm. It was, yeah. yeah. I was criticized a lot, you know, like for maintaining that uh, the Chinese revolution was a socialist revolution. I've been criticized a lot for even just saying that and for saying that China is still a worker state. Okay, it's not socialist, but it's still, you know, a workers and peasants state, you know, like Lenin talked about, more so, you know, in China than in Russia. But, you know, I get criticized for not denouncing China, the state, you know, the workers and peasant state as being imperialist, which I don't think it is. Now, the private sector of China and its investments have an imperialist strategy. It's not the same as the the, the grab and run, you know, like a looting strategy of the Western imperialists who come in and take all the resources they can get, you know, for peanuts. They do development. They do, you know, build the roads to get to their project and all of that. And, but... You know, they're not training local people to become workers, professional, you know, construction workers. Mm -hmm. They're not, you know, helping those countries to become independent like Libya did with the African Union. They're not, you know, like educating, you know, people. They are in there using Chinese workers for the sake of the private Chinese corporation with an imperialist strategy in the long term that is nonetheless benevolent and benign but nonetheless imperialist. I agree with that. And that's what I announced previously. But now, because I don't consider that, you know, Chinese state loans, you know, to African countries are also a form of finance imperialism, I got criticized, you know, for saying that that, that wasn't imperialist, that that was political, that there is no uh, economic agenda associated with those loans because it is made by China for political reasons, because they want to support, you know, the third world. This the third world supporting the third world. And I don't see that as being, you know, imperialist. And that's not the private sector. That's the public sector or the state sector mm -hmm. of China, that which is doing that. So I, I make this, you know, nuance, you know, like evaluation. But I still get, you know, criticized for saying that I deny, you know, Chinese imperialism. Okay, fine. <laughs> you know, like, really, you know. Well, like, I mean, I mean. People in general, I think, have a um, difficult time recognizing nuance, and that's, that's... <laughs> they don't even know the word. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Would you consider the Russian Federation imperialist? Good question. You know, like we had a big uh, discussion about that last week in the uh, convergence. We're going to have another convergence session tomorrow, and I'll we can uh, we discuss that. You know, with Kara last week and she had some pretty good arguments and uh i discussed uh, the matter as well you know like calling for the recognition of the donbass nationalities the uh 
uh, Gonesk and Lugansk uh, national uh, people's uh, autonomies and their militias. Uh, but there was a certain argument, you know, that was being made. And we had to get into a discussion of what the character of the Crimea was, considering that the Tartars that were living there previously and it was their territory and they were, you know, expelled by Stalin somehow, somewhere in Pakistan. And uh, they may or may not want to come back. You know, it's all very sort of, you know, like you know, obscure to a certain extent. But I don't think that the motivation for Russia going into the Ukraine is imperialist because they've agreed that they're not going to go beyond the Danube River. They agreed that they're not, you know, interested in occupying Ukraine. They have <laughs> agreed to uh, helping the Donbass and Lugansk, you know, republics, you know, liberate themselves, you know, from centralized Ukrainian control after it became a nation state instead of a federation or a confederation rather, which is what it was before. So I, I think that Russia has a justification because they were called into supporting the local militias that were defending themselves against the central uh, state control from Kiev that sent the military in to uh, basically massacre the population or to convince them to run away into Russia and give up the territory that the central authority wanted to incorporate into this into the nation state. So I'm I'm very sympathetic, you know, to to the Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, and uh, Crimea, I think, you know, should stay with Russia because it's their only way to have sea access and to have their navy to defend Russia. So I think that they have legitimacy and considering that to be a, a matter of uh, 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 existential uh, priority. So, I mean, that's my answer on, on terms of uh, the Russian imperialism. I think I think the main imperialist agent and was was NATO. I mean NATO. Uh, NATO is in, all, in, in, all into a slow invasion of Russia, you know, and they want to break up Russia into a bunch of territories under the control yeah. of various uh, great powers in the West. After the Cold War ended, George H. W. Bush said they wouldn't move one inch to the east. Yeah, it wasn't, but it wasn't written. That was the problem. They, yeah. The, the yeah, Russian... there's, there's one email to that effect, and that's what Russia uses to uh, to, uh, to, to legitimatize it. Well, Russia got outmaneuvered there, you know, like, you know, <laughs> withdrawal, you know, like without any sort of guarantees, without any gu written guarantees. Really? You know, like that was, what do they think? They, you know, that they should have confidence in the West, confidence in the United States of America, Nelson, confidence in Nelson. the only country that has used nuclear bombs on another country, really. The only country that's used nuclear bombs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only no. one. Yeah. Okay, Pink Floyd. <sighs> what should we do now? Um. Well, I'm not actually sure, but. There, there's one point I would like to bring up from a Maoist perspective that the Soviet Union will, was called a, what's social imperialist. Oh, yeah, I've heard that term. Yeah. I don't know what I mean, that means, though. I think that uh, the Soviet Union was, <clears throat> was annexing territory that did not have a revolution of its own after right. having defeated the Nazi occupation of those countries. And if they would have uh, let those countries uh, take off on their own, they would have probably, you know, like chosen uh, to be Nazis again. You know, <laughs> the Nazis were very strong in those countries. Oh yeah. You know, the, it was only the Nazis that were, you know, organized in those countries. It was a, would be the Nazis that would be taking over those countries if they were allowed to. Those mm -hmm. countries had to be denazified like uh, Russia is talking about doing in uh, Ukraine. But their attempts to do so have failed. Ukraine remains uh, re remains uh, pretty uh, dogmatic. So I think that Russia is going to give up on the denazification of Ukraine and just insist that they not to become a member of NATO and not have you know nuclear missiles installed eight minutes away from Moscow. 
they won't allow that, but they're going to allow Ukraine to remain sovereign and they won't go further than the Danube River. Yeah. So that, that's what I think about the term social imperialist. I think that it's an exaggeration. Perhaps. Yeah. But it was a pretty rough place, you know, like I can tell you uh, some stories, a couple of stories of my parents, you know, that they endured in the Soviet Union. They were in the Soviet Union during the war after they escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto and the Lublin Ghetto. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I try to tell people about this, you know, but a lot of Marxists, you know, they don't want to know, <laughs> you know, they don't want to know what it was like, you know, for workers inside the Soviet Union. It's as if, you know, like, you know, it, it's not important that the workers are not important, you know, but and they're supposed to be Marxists. But my father, you know, like was, uh, he, he came to the Soviet Union and said that he came there, you know, to work, not because he was trying to escape from the Nazis. And that's why they allowed him in. You know, they wouldn't have allowed him in if he said that he was a Jewish refugee from Nazis. So first of all, you know, there was anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union. Okay. Mm -hmm. There was anti-Semitism uh, anti as well. It was illegal to be anti-Semitic and to make uh, anti-Semitic, you know, comments. And in fact, you know, my father made a complaint against one guy one time who was anti-Semitic to him, and the guy got arrested and put into prison. <laughs> then one day, my father had a sore foot, went to a doctor, figuring, you know, that that was, you know, the what, you know, workers in a, in a socialist society should do. The doctor, you know, got pissed off with him, you know, maybe because he was Jewish, and said that, you know, because... He came to the doctor, that meant that he could have gone to work, and so he shouldn't have missed his day of work. And there was militarization of labor, you know, he couldn't, you know, take off from work. Your work was compulsory. This was Trotsky's idea yep. in the in the in, you know in the first world war, uh during the civil war. And uh so the doctor refused to give him a letter of uh permission to have missed a day of work, which is what was required. So he went and went back to work the next day. You know, he was asked, where's your letter of permission for having missed a day of work? Didn't have a letter of permission. And so the Jewish woman communist, who was the head of the so-called Union or or Soviet, mm -hmm. had him arrested. He was put into prison for six months. And then when he got to court, you know, the judge, you know, like liberated him and said, you know, like that, that was ridiculous and exempted him from compulsory labor thereafter. So he was free to travel around and he, you know, engaged in black market, you know, exchange of goods from one city to another. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, what the Soviet Union was like. Rather pathetic, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but that's good. What he did was good. Yeah. Yeah. He stood up. My mother told me about how, you know, Jewish refugees had so little food to eat, you know, that they would eat the peels that were thrown out by the Russians. You know, potato peels. Mm -hmm. And that's what they would live on. Which was a very good thing to do, you know, because potato peels have more nutrients than potatoes do. So mm -hmm. she survived. Yeah, it's the same thing that happened in uh, in China with uh, brown rice. You know, the 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 royals in in China, like the emperor's family, uh, thought that brown rice was you know, was 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 a was something for the peasants, and mm -hmm. and 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 that and that they should only have white rice. Mm -hmm. And but but the. So the peasants had 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 the brown rice, and there was some kind of disease that that was caused by not having a substance that was in the brown rice, and only, oh. the, only the emperor's family got it. <laughs> <laughs> this is reminds me of another such uh, uh, factor, you know, in, in Canada here in Quebec, even, you know, uh, the the they used to have these mills, you know, run by water wheels. And they put the grain in, you know, the first, you know, like a grinder that the stones would grind it, you know, down and it would, you know, break up into the various constituents and they would divide it into uh, uh, different sort of categories. Mm -hmm. And they would not only, you know, uh, grind, you know, the wheat, they would also grind oats, mm -hmm. but not for humans. The oats they would grind only for animals because they thought that oatmeal and oat grain was only good enough for animals and not for humans. But as it turns out, you know, oats, you know, are just as nutritious or perhaps yeah. more nutritious than flour. But flour is white, you know. <laughs> yep. It's the same problem again, white versus brown. Oh, my. <laughs> yep, yep, yep.
Same thing with hominy grits. You know, the people people would take the uh, the, the 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 husk off, off the hominy grits, and and basically just take out all the nutritious value from it. But uh, wow. pe people in people in, in the South who actually who were poor, who could only who could who couldn't afford to uh, uh, take 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 off the husk, they, they had a much healthier diet. You know, the hominy gave them protein. Wow. We lost oh, it. All of these examples. Okay, oh, yeah. here he is back again. Yeah, all of these examples, you know, one after the other, you know, like a, of this uh, white, yep. uh, you know, white is, uh, what is it? What, what would you call that? You know, like, it got to be a such psych psychological term for this kind of mental illness. You know, it's, it's like, a, uh, and then, you know, like, whiteness okay the white nation you know like mentality you know uh, as well as white food you know <laughs> and 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 white paper you know everything has to be white you know like mm -hmm. really you know this is a oh, this is what this is a uh i guess you call it the uh, bleaching phenomenon yeah, yeah. And Trump, you know, advocating bleach, you know, as a solution to COVID, yeah. you know, like, you know, and, and also so, so many women, you know, like using bleach, you know, to wash the floors, you know, every day in their house, you know, producing a lot of, you know, poison in the air <laughs> as a result. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, like, it's primitive. That's what it is. It's primitive, very primitive mentalities. It's so underdeveloped, you know, human mentality is still so underdeveloped. And yet, you know, at the end of the 19th century, you know, the, the scientists were saying that everything had been discovered because they were using causal, you know, like uh, methodology. And then Einstein blew it all up in the 2005. Mm -hmm. That's why I call it the 2005 Einsteinian revolution. That's when the dialectic was implemented in physics. When he made uh, uh, the... Uh, created a proof and theory of the uh, non-divisibility, you know, between uh, energy and matter. So he mm. took two quantities, which were according to, you know, classical physics, you know, distinct, different, counterposed, and united them dialectically to become something that was essentially different and, and reduced it to its essential nature. Mm. You know, so that's why I love, you know, like I loved physics so much, you know, because of that. And that's why I would give credit, you know, to Einstein for having developed the most uh, the most sophisticated, you know, theory of dialectics. The, the sad thing about Einstein was that he he recognized that there was quantum physics, but he didn't like it because he, this is not <laughs> yeah. my theories of relativity. So he just rejected it, even though he saw it. Yeah, yeah, he was still caught up, you know, in the old, you know, classical model to some extent. Yeah. You know, I would say. You know, he, he couldn't break away from it completely. You know, totally he opened the door. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. He was also excellent on, he quit the Zionist movement. You know, he was a Zionist in the twenties, but he was a non-state Zionist. He was a cultural Zionist together with uh, some of the others. Martin Huber and uh, they all ended up, you know, quitting the Zionist movement, you know, because they went, you know, into a statist formation. He later um, became a socialist as well. Yeah, he was a socialist. He yeah. was, yeah. Well, yeah. so was Martin Buber. Yeah, Buber. Yeah, yeah. Well, great talking with you. You know, it really does a lot for me. You know, to make me feel like we are real. We are the Jewish Socialist Bund, and mm -hmm. we exist. And I wish you all a good Shabbos. Now that the sun is setting here. Yes. And uh, we will come back to you every Friday for Shabbos. Shabbos yes. with the Bund. And I'm going to make it more live streams from now on as well. Yeah. Good. Okay. So now uh, you uh, have, I have a copy of this recording. I'm going to send it out and, uh, and if we can, uh, I'll upload it, you know, to YouTube and then it can be shared, you know, using a YouTube address. Mm -hmm. Very good. Great. Okay. Los mirale lebens nainem mit Cycle, Shitvis, and Shulam. This is my Yiddish. I have to use it sometime. <laughs>
I've got to put my glasses on for a second to see how to do this. So what I said in Yiddish there was, uh, let us all live together in, uh, in uh, with wisdom. Uh, Seichel is wisdom. Mm -hmm. Shitvis means reciprocity. And Shula means peace. That was my That's mother. That's what uh, my Yiddish experience. She knew yeah. she was fluent in it. My father was yeah. in it. Yeah. Never taught me it. No, no. Yeah. Well, now only the Hasidim speak Yiddish. So I, I guess I have to move to Mer uh, Sharim, you know, neighborhood in Jerusalem to be able to speak Yiddish. I will. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>